Thanks for having me this morning. As Jessica said, I'm Shauna Keys. I, hey, look at this guy. Look at this handsome guy. I lead our intercession ministry here at Bridgeway. And I'm married to that hot guy right there. That's, I like having you young people here. That's Adam. He's one of the pastors here. And we have almost been married 11 years. So I, I was looking back yesterday. I wanted to show you a wedding picture so that you could kind of get the feel of where we are. Hey. Yes, looking good. There we go. Oh. I just wanted to point out a few things. I mean, I think it's just important to note that I look exactly the same. And Adam looks a little bit different. First of all, he looks like he's 15. Like he's not legally able to be married. And also, he in all of our wedding pictures is green. I know you guys are like, what? He's like all washed out and pale because that morning of our wedding, he woke up and threw up all day. He had the stomach flu on our wedding day. Isn't that so sad? You want to hear something even more sad? I got the stomach bug on our honeymoon. So I spent six nights and seven days in a small cabin in the bathroom. So if you're thinking right now in your spirit, the Holy Spirit's jumping up and he's like, go ahead and pay for their second honeymoon. I'll be accepting all of those funds after the service. Aren't American weddings so fun and different? People spend a lot of money on weddings. But weddings in Jesus' time were way different. I've been looking at this because I've been preparing for the message today, and I've been reading all of this stuff about Jewish weddings and the betrothal and all of that stuff, and it is so fascinating. Have any of you studied that, read that at all? Oh, my goodness. There's, like, no hands. We totally need to do a series on this. But it would take like eight weeks because there is so much richness when you, when you go back and look at all everything bridal. And it helps you to understand so much about the scriptures. And, but it really would take eight weeks. So speaking of eight weeks, do you all remember the eight-week most amazing series I've ever heard that Chad preached on the orphan spirit? It seriously was the best series I've ever heard. So if you haven't heard it, you need to go back. They're all online. You need to listen to it. But I'm going to make a lot of reference to it today. So I kind of want to back up and get you there in case you were not here for that series. But seriously, go back and listen to it. It just dismantled so much of what the enemy has tried to use to come against your destiny. And you are a son and a daughter. You are not an orphan. You belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you live in your Father's house. Amen? Amen. Okay. So Chad set the table for you, and I'm standing on this side. I'm going to come over there. Don't worry. I'm not ignoring you. I'm standing on this side because this is where he kind of set the table for us over here. If you go back and watch, you'll remember that he called that side of the stage Lodi Bar, which is where Mephibosheth lived before he knew that he had a seat at the king's table. So right here is the king's table. This is your father's house. And right here, you have an identity. And it is sonship. Everybody say sonship. Sonship. And you have a purpose. Everybody say purpose. purpose. And your purpose is to stay here in your father's house. Don't wander back off to Lodi Bar. You belong here. You have a place at the table in your father's house. Everybody say, remain at the table. table. Yes, and your job here is also to get other people to the table. And then you're going to help them stay at the table in their father's house. That's called discipleship. So your job is to remember that you have a place there and to get other people there and get them to stay there with you, right? Right. 
Okay, so Chad has had the staff reading this book. This is a really cool book. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and over 25 million copies of this book have been sold. So maybe some of you in here have read this. Yeah, I see some heads. So this is really cool. This, I, I really enjoyed this book. It, it, it's got seven habits that will help you be more effective in what you're doing. I want to read just a little excerpt from one of the habits, which is called Begin with the End in Mind. So look with me. To begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. It means to know where you're going so that you better understand where you are now and so that the steps you take are always in the right direction. It's incredibly easy to get caught up in an activity trap, in the busyness of life, to work harder and harder at climbing the ladder of success, only to discover it's leaning against the wrong wall. It is possible to be busy, very busy, without being very effective. We in the kingdom call that striving. It is possible to let your days get away from you and realize you've just been striving. You've been working really hard but you're, to climb that ladder, but your ladder is against the wrong wall. So I want us today to begin with the end in mind. In the book, he has you imagine your funeral. What would you want said of you at your funeral? Who would you want to be there? What would you want them to be saying about you at the end? But we as believers know that our funeral is not the end. This is not the end for us. We have a journey of life. We have a destiny. And when we get here, this is not the end. Death is not the end. It's the beginning of something beautiful. And so I'm going to set another table for you. This table is the marriage table. So in the end, you will have another identity. We're starting in sonship and daughtership. We will end as co-rulers with Jesus Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We end as the bride. That is our identity. Everybody say the bride. That's you. If you are a born-again believer, you are the bride of Christ. And in the end, your purpose will be to co-reign with Jesus Christ. Does that not blow your mind? That blows my mind. So let's read some scripture. First, let's start over here. This is the king's table. This is your sonship. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. No, the father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Here we are. Here is where we belong, with our Father in our Father's house. And over here is the marriage table. Let's look at Revelation 19, 6 through 8. What's this going to look like? Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing water and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. So you have... Your father's house, you're a son and a daughter. 
And beginning with the end in mind, here we are at the marriage table. So what's in between? What do we do now? As a family, as, as our Bridgeway family, we have all said, yes, we are going to stay here. We're going to remain in our sonship and our daughtership. Leif Hetland was here last weekend, and he uh, just reminded us as a family that the prophetic word spoken over this house is to be a model of family, what family looks like, what it means to stay here in your father's house, bring people into the house with you, and you're all a big, happy family together. And so we've all said yes to that, but what's in between? What do we do now? Where are we going? So Chad asked me if I would come speak to you today about what does it look like to give your yes to the Lord? Because between here and the marriage table are a whole lot of yeses to the Lord. What does that look like? So as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about my own family and what it looks like to walk in a healthy family. And so I want to show you a picture of my kids. Oh, you said all before the picture even came up. (laughs) These are my babies. They're all babies. Abe is nine. He can be like real serious. He can also be real silly, not a whole lot in between for those of you that know him. Asher's seven. He's the one with the football. He uh, loves sports. He's super funny, really easy kid. And Jet is five. He's right there. All of my kids are really, really different. They all uh, act differently. Their personalities are differently. And I have to raise them all differently. It's no different in your father's house. He is raising you up in the way that you should go. Now, I don't expect my kids to raise themselves. I don't expect them to know right from wrong unless I've taught them. So I'm constantly instructing them, but I'm also very mindful of who they are as individuals. I'm thinking about, you know, are they going to want to be into athletics? Are any, do any of them seem to be interested in music? Because we will want to get them into music. And I'm looking individually at each one of their little souls, and I'm saying, how can I begin with the end in mind? Because I'm not raising them to live with us forever. Eventually, I would really like for them to end up at the marriage table. So I'm beginning with the end in mind. And as I raise them, I want them to have really good character. I want them to know their purpose. I want them to stay and know that they are loved right here in the Father's house. They are, you are loved. You're accepted. You belong. But I'm also training you up. And that looks like something. So when I think about Asher, Asher's the middle one. He is super silly. He has the worst potty mouth you can ever imagine. Since he could speak, he was saying poop every day. It was just like walk around saying poopy, poopy, poopy. So I wanted to show you this really awesome picture he drew for me yesterday. <laughs> Isn't it so great? So we're thinking like either he's going to be a proctologist or a youth pastor. But actually, he's kind of a good artist. That's pretty good for a seven-year-old, isn't it? So, you know, we're looking maybe into art, too. But our Father knows us. And all along the process, he is thinking of you as an individual and what your destiny is and where you're going. So let me read you some scripture from Revelation 20, 11 through 13. Then I saw a great white throne... And him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. I want you to remember that. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person so judged according to what they had done. This is the word of God. Yes? Okay. 
when you get here, you are going to be presented as completely pure, righteous, and clean. Last, last service, I said, you are going to be dressed in fine white leather. I don't know why I said that. I don't know what you're going to dress, be dressed in. You might be dressed in linen, but I'm going to be dressed in pure white leather. <laughs> what I meant to say was when you're here, you will be presented as a pure bride in fine white linen. Or if you're me, leather with leather boots. You can have your Birkenstocks. <laughs> you are not going to be judged according to how clean you are. You can spend all of this time trying to get cleaned up, but you're already going to be presented as pure. What you will be judged on are those books. What those books are, they are your destiny. And before time began, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit came together as a council to decide who you would be. And they wrote down your destiny in a book. And in the end, those books will be open. Now, all of you, if you are a born-again believer, your name is written in the book of life. Hallelujah. Amen. But he will also open the books of your destiny. And you will be judged according to what you have done. That Greek word, what you have done, actually means your profession, your job. Did you do your job while you were here? Amen. Not are you clean, not did you say a bad poopy word. <laughs> did you do your job while you were here? Yeah. <sighs> if you're living as a son and a daughter, it's really easy to do your job. Yeah. It naturally flows from you if you stay there in your father's house. But it's also really easy to get really busy and not realize that you're not really walking in your destiny because you're just striving and trying really hard to do the right thing or to just survive life. So I want to share a testimony from my own life over the past four months, and I hope that you will find a place to relate in your life to it. But it's kind of a story of me really being in my father's house, but not realizing there were things that were holding me back from my destiny, from walking really well in my profession, in my job here on the earth, in my purposes. And so it starts here. This summer, my parents were going away for a month, and they offered to, to uh, let me come stay in their home for one whole month. They live in Daytona Beach, Florida. So that's, like, awesome. That's where I grew up. And so um, I had some friends come stay with me. There was family with me for some of that. But I, I brought my kids down there, and we had a whole month at the beach. It was amazing. It, I was able to kind of step back from life for a little while. And it was probably the most intimate time that I've ever had with the Lord. So I was just eating up books. I mean, I read a ton of books. I was getting revelation from all the things I was reading. Uh, my prayer life was just alive. I just felt so close to the Lord. I felt him so close to me. I felt the Father's love on me. I felt the love of Jesus with me. And it was beautiful and amazing. When I came back, it's like I hit a wall. And I was dried up. I felt like I just hit a wall. It was where, what happened? Where's that intimacy that I was experiencing with the Lord, where I was really getting revelation? Because you know what revelation is. When you get revelation, you're learning more about him. When you get revelation, it's about knowing him. It's about intimacy. And I was getting that, and then all of a sudden I hit this wall, and my soul was crying out, I need more of you. What happened? I need more of you. And so I started calling out for a new wineskin. 
and I started calling out for new wine. And what that means and what that meant to me was that's like a call to the marriage table. I'm calling out for wine from the banqueting table. I want more of you. I need more of you. I need to be back where we were. What happened? And so I, uh, I came to church one Sunday morning, and I felt like the Lord said that Chad had my wineskin. So I marched myself up to the front. I said, you got my wineskin, and I want it. Give me my wineskin. And Chad said to me, that's awesome. I want to pray for you for that. But I have to tell you that what I'm seeing over you in the spirit is I see that you are bloodied and battered and bruised. And he said, I want to pray for you about that. So that can happen in this journey that we have as Christians. We can get battered and bruised, and we can spend a lot of time in intercession and warfare for other people, and we can just hit that point where we're like, I'm done. I'm spent. I got nothing to give. And that's how I felt. And so when he said that, it really resonated with me. So worship started, and we were in the middle of worship, and I immediately went into a vision. So what I mean by that is when I go into a vision, it looks something like this. My closed, and the Spirit of God comes over my imagination. So I started imagining a scene in my mind. That's what I mean by going into a vision. So I started to imagine this scene in my mind, and it was not my own thoughts. And what it was was Jesus. And I was there in the middle of a battlefield, and it was a wide open field, and I was by myself. And I was down on the ground. And Jesus came to me, and he scooped me up. And he said, I see you. And he walked me off to the side of the battlefield, and he laid me down. And I said, you going you gonna to help me? You're, you're like, going to send the angels or something? And he said, no, I'm going to let you die. And then he said, will you? And I said, yes, Lord. I will. Every time. Every time I will die for you. Every time. So what I knew in my spirit was that he was saying, will you die to yourself? And I said, yes, I will die to myself every time. Even if I feel weak and poured out and done, it's worth it for you. Every time I will get to this point. Because you're worth it. So, by saying yes to that, I didn't realize really what I was saying yes to. Until about three days later. So we were at home. Three days later, we were at home, and Adam did something that really triggered me. And... What that means is I was living in Orphanville. <laughs> that was on me. I get triggered. I'm thinking about, oh, it just oh, it made me mad, and I'm right, and he's wrong. and So I'm just triggered, you know, like I'm just inside. Just, meh, 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 meh. I don't think I even said anything to him. So that was at night. I get in the bed. Adam gets in the bed next to me, and we're falling asleep. And I don't know how to explain this really to put words to it, but I hope that you'll follow with me. Laying in the bed, my spirit woman opens up. And I'm able to see with my spirit eyes. I don't know how to explain it other than it just opened up. I cried last service, I'm going to cry again. And what I saw was my pride. And he allowed me to see that. But what he allowed me to see was the distance that my pride had created between myself and Adam. My sin was creating this vast distance between myself and my groom. That's what sin will do. That's why he hates it. 
And I'm not saying this to condemn you. I did not feel condemned. But I felt the weight of my sin. And it scared me. Because I felt the distance that it created between myself and Adam. And so I woke him up and I just wept. I said, I'm so sorry. I didn't see it. And he's just awesome. He's so gracious. He just said, you know, like, we're going to walk through this together. I'm not going to rescue you. That's a good man. I need an amen from the ladies in here. That's a good man. He did not say, I'm going to fix this, or no, it's fine. He said, okay, if the Lord is showing this to you, then we're going to walk through this, and I am right here with you. That's a good man. So I want to note something really, really important. I want you to remember this. The very next morning, I woke up and I said, I must confess this. This must come out in confession. Confession is so powerful. So I woke up in the morning and I called a good friend of mine who I knew I could trust. And I said, I have to confess this to you and you have to hold me accountable to this. And she has. And then, I, and then I felt the Holy Spirit say, you need to confess this to Chad. Because Chad is my boss, he's my leader, but he's also a big brother to me. And so that night he just happened to be at my house and I confessed everything to him. And I said, you have to pray for me. Because confess your sins one to another and pray for each other and you'll be healed. Yes. So Chad prayed for me. He said, I feel like the Holy Spirit saying this is going to be a six-week process. And I said, well, it's all coming out. Because I felt the weight of the separation. I thought, "Mm mm-mm, no. So for the next five days, I felt what can only be described from me as a crushing. Does that sound like wine? Remember, I was calling out for new wine. I felt this crushing in my spirit. It felt kind of like depression. Depression. And a lot like grief. It grieved me. But again, I don't want you to hear that I felt condemned because I did not. I rejoiced because my father had revealed something to me that was unhealthy and not good for me. And so I was like ready to go. Let's do this. Yes, Lord. But I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that it felt amazing. It, it hurts. It hurts to say yes to death, but at the end of it, it is a glorious, beautiful, magnificent picture of grace and mercy. Listen to me. When you're here, you are dressed in white, fine linen or leather. (laughs) You're clean. You have nothing to be condemned about. But you will be judged according to your job. And so I praise the Lord, oh my soul, that he revealed this sin that I had hidden within me. Because I'm telling you, now it's different. I'm walking in my destiny with a freedom that I've never had. So some things that he showed to me were like, I had this independence that was rising up in me in my marriage. And I was like, I got this, I can do it, because I was afraid. He's not going to stand for that fear. So now are things different in my marriage? Yes, I feel differently. He also revealed to me some false humility that I had in walking out in my giftings. I'm prophetic. But I was withholding my prophetic gift because, and, and kind of rationing it out. Because I wanted to control how much people were putting a draw on me. And the father lovingly said, hey, I gave you that gift so you can love people. You don't need to ration out your love. Go for it. I'm your champion. Be awesome at the prophetic. I want you to be awesome at it. Because it's a love tool. 
Don't ration that out. Go, girl. So I said, okay. He also showed me that I had some fear of man. That's really easy to walk in that without realizing it. And so I said, no more. I'm going to walk in that destiny. I am who you created me to be. So I want to make a really clear note to you that along the way, as he pointed these things out, I did not feel condemned. I felt very loved because he gave me revelation with everything he pointed out. Everything he pointed out came with revelation truth. He did not leave me hanging on one thing. And so now I'm walking with revelation truth. I know the scriptures to stand on. I know the concepts to believe in. He gave me a revelation for each thing he pointed out. And now I can walk in the confidence. Because see, I was struggling with pride, but now I'm walking in confidence. So what does this journey look like? A lot of things. Celebration, community, discipleship, Bible study, kids, friends, and a little bit of death. A little bit of dying along the way. Because he cares about your purity. Not because he's not going to present you as pure, but because he wants you to walk in freedom all the way along in your destiny. Your destiny is your job here, and he is your champion. He wants you to do well at this thing. So if that means he's going to draw out impurities, you need to let him do it, and you need to say, yes, Lord, I will die for you every time I will die for you because you will have a freedom in your mind that allows you to walk in such confidence. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond this morning. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about anything, I want you to respond. If he's showing you, yes, you are in a purifying process, I want you to respond to him. If you feel that dried up, I hit a wall, I don't know, I feel poured out place, I want you to respond to him. If you're saying, I don't know my purpose, I don't know my destiny, I want you to respond to him. Because your response to him is a great big yes in the spirit. And every yes you give him is practicing for an eternal I do. He's worth it. And you're worth it. So I want you to respond this morning. We're going to, I want to read some scripture. And I, we're going to play a song. And that's going to be your time to really get with the Holy Spirit and say, what are we looking at here? Is this just that I'm dried out or you, do you need to show me something? Because I don't want to be an orphan. I want to stay in my daddy's house and I want to journey and get trained up all the way to that marriage table. Let me read this scripture to you. The word of God speaks, does it not? Yes. Rev, uh, this is Philippians 3, 7, 7 through 12. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. You have an opportunity every day to pick up your cross and follow him. And die to yourself every day. Say yes to him. It is worth it. And it's because he loves you. 
I want to share one more thing. My son, who's five, you saw his picture. He's five. Get this, five. This morning he comes up to the side of my bed. He says, Mommy, I had a good dream last night. And I said, what was it? I thought he was going to talk about Harvest Festival tonight. I said, what was it? He said, Jesus died on the cross. And I fell on him. And his blood got all over me. And then God came and helped me from the mouth of a five-year-old. We can die with him because we'll get covered in his blood. We'll be presented as pure and spotless. And when we look back, and when he looks back, he'll go, well done. You did it. You did a great job. You walked in your destiny while you were on the earth. Let's go reign together. Amen.